Our next two presenters are a mother-daughter combo, and uh, this is kind of unprecedented for Tick. We've not had food at Tick in this capacity, and uh, we're really excited to have these two here to share how they've taken family com consumer sciences and incorporated computer engineering into it. So we're going to hear from both of them. We have Carol Van Wardheisen and Laura Van Wardheisen. And they are going to share a variety of things for you as our next presenters. Uh, also, because they are going together, it's going to be about an hour and a half or so. We are going to take a break midway through. You'll have a chance to try some of the pancakes, I believe. So we will have an opportunity to take a break as well. So without further ado, here they are. Thank you. Um, because you know that uh, FCS people like to have, you know, food-related, you know, idiosyncrasies, we are three peas in a pod. And so I would like to introduce my student teacher of, this is your third day now? Yep. <laughs> and so Carly, uh, really Ken, uh, Carly Kenyon is an Iowa State student, and so she is just lucky enough to be away from school at professional development today. You know, I didn't want to put any slides up because then you would calculate my age, but I did graduate from Iowa State University in 1979 with my Bachelor of Science in Home Ec Ed. And so when some people say, oh, you're a home economist or you're, you teach Home Ec, yeah, that's what I graduated with. And I'm not ashamed of it, but that changed a long time ago. And then my claim to fame was I, um, First out of college sold microwaves. And so when my students were talking about the pancake bot, they said, oh, it's so expensive. And I said, hey, in 1979, the first microwaves were $599. And everybody was buying it for their, their loved ones because it was such new technology. And so I so, uh, sold microwaves for Sears and did their cooking classes. You could get free cooking classes. So Microwave I feel- cooking. I feel like from the moment I got my Easy Bake Oven under the Christmas tree <laughs> in 1963, I think that I've been happily a uh, techno freak. So there's lots of great chefs that had Easy Bake Ovens, and so I'm not even afraid to show you my teal colored uh, Easy Bake Oven. Uh, when we fast forward, I did uh, work for Iowa State University Extension as an extension home economist and um, tested pressure canners for years and, and did those kinds of things. But then I had children and decided uh, the community college in Fort Dodge uh, asked me to be their home personal and family development specialist and so I coordinated all the adult education courses for that. So I did that for a stint while the kids were young. Then um, my husband took a job tra transfer at one point. So then we moved to Waterloo and I started teaching at their parochial school because they had eliminated FCS. And then I said, oh, I kind of like being with the students now that I'm older because when I substitute taught, I hated it, you know. And then I moved into West High School in Waterloo, and then I was recruited to come to Ames High School uh, about 11 years ago. Some of the other things that I've, you know, kind of like early tech things, 1991, I think, is when I bought my first home color compute, or color printer, and that was the good old HP 500C, and so that's before some of you were born. I had a color printer at home, and then I like to, um, I guess that's because I had the, the two daughters, and I wanted them to have color printing um, capabilities, which they utilized to the fullest. One time we printed uh, 50 puppy dog invitations um, to a birthday party, you know, for the neighborhood puppy dog. So I say all that in just saying I like technology. I have all the kitchen gizmos, even the ones that don't work. I have a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, I had clickers 11 years ago, if you know the uh, student response system. And I just like technology and I, I want to share something with you and we pray it works today. Um, 
One of the best things I've done in life, though, is create two wonderful daughters. And Laura's here with us. Uh, she has Andrea's been, alive. That's, yeah. that's, <laughs> Andrea made it sound like my she's younger here with one. Us. She's she'll here introduce with herself, but my younger one is a science teacher taught in Anchorage seven years in forensic science. And now she's uh, doing some part time work in nutrition education in Michigan. And so I think that you might enjoy our things, but if you get bored, uh, please stand up, come up and shake our tree. Uh, we want to make this entertaining for you. And Paige has been in my classroom, I think. You're probably the only one that's been in my classroom, and that was a few years ago, too. So I'm going to let Laura do a presentation. So I'm Laura Van Wardhuizen. I am the oldest daughter. When I graduated from high school, I told my mom that I was not going to do two things. I was not going to be a teacher, and I was not going to Iowa State. Well, you know, one out of two ain't bad. <laughs> um, I went to UNI. I got a degree in textiles and apparel. Um, if you've ever, if you haven't been, you should visit UNI's textile and apparel program. They have a multi-million dollar grant from the government. They are one of the very few quality assurance testing labs left in the U.S. Um, they really have some cutting edge equipment and technology there. Um, but that's where I received my education. Um, that made me very marketable to um, companies that emphasized quality. So my first job out of uh, college was at Land's End. Um, I started in the quality assurance department where I developed some technical specs. But then I transitioned to um, design because quali the quality assurance field just didn't feel like the right field. So I worked in design for a couple years and that one didn't feel just right and I realized when I was in college, I could do all the things. I didn't have to specialize. And I realized I'm one of those people that likes to, like, I'll watch a show on TV and I'll be like, listen, did you know that the clownfish can change its gender or sex at will based on the needs of the population? Like, I'll just come up with random stuff like that. So, turns out I'm a teacher after all. I came back to Iowa. Um, I went to Grandview University to get my family and consumer sciences education um, degree, second bachelor's, woo, don't recommend that route. But um, I recently finished up my master's at Drake. I have been teaching for, this is my 10th year, and I've been at Waukee High School. Um, and so today we really want to share with you um, why FCS was the original Tech Girls. All right. Maybe. But it really starts with this wonderful cat lady, Ellen Swallow Richards. She is, um, she was the first female student and later a lecturer at MIT. And at the turn of the 20th century, she spearheaded a committee of some of the best minds at the time to brainstorm and develop a science, a new science called home economics. Home economics was the pursuit of the ideal environment through the study of applied and social sciences. Though Swallow Richards saw it as a vehicle for change for women, she didn't view it as the domestic domain solely for women. Um, in fact, she was invited to present at the Chicago World's Fair um, because she was one of the first people to industrialize the kitchen, uh, which resulted in school lunches as we know them. And she refused to be part of the women's tent because she didn't believe that, women, that nutrition was just for women. Um, Home economics programs were one of the first available to college for young women. Um, at Iowa State University, not only would they teach you about the science of cooking, they also taught you to disassemble and reassemble all your kitchen appliances. So for many, it was the first way and the only way into engineering and physics. But the irony lies that in becoming a vehicle for the advancement of women, um, home economics soon became stigmatized by that. Um, critics of the program claimed that it was simply to churn out meek, domesticated housewives. And so kind of seeking to distance themselves from the Becky Homecky image, in 1997, um, the name was officially changed to Family and Consumer Sciences. Um, the irony is that in seeking to Um, be known, we lost our identity. Um, around the world, um, we continue to still be known as home ec. Um, the US is one of the only places that uses the family and consumer sciences. And constantly I have to go up to people and be like, I teach FCS. And they're like, what's that? And I'm like, home ec. I don't mind the name. Um, 
So familiarity was lost, just like with a lot of these guys. A lot of failed kind of attempts at rebranding. Um, and at the same time, schools are facing the demands of high stakes testing um, and budget cuts. So programs began to diminish um, due to lost student enrollment in the last five years, or in the last 10 years, has decreased by 38%. But the data also reveals some positive trends. Um, enrollment by gender has become more equitable, um, and demand is there. Half of, uh, half, of our, um, half of the state's report, it's difficult to find qualified teachers to fill their openings. Our hands-on environment is especially useful to students with diverse needs. So today, FCS consists of five main areas, food and nutrition, personal financial management, human development across the lifespan, textiles, clothing, apparel, and the production of those things, as well as housing interiors and understanding housing situational needs of the environment and community. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the things that FCS does, these things are taught in different areas, but FCS approaches them in a different way. Um, almost 5 million adolescents today are overweight or obese, but at the same time, 17% of children are food insecure, meaning no, they don't know where their next meal is coming from. And these trends aren't mutually exclusive. In our culture, the cheapest, most convenient foods are the highly addictive ones because of trans fats and extra sugars. A study comparing FCS and health textbooks concluded that both contained accurate information about food and nutrition, but FCS went a step further and actually taught them how to prepare healthy meals that they could envision themselves preparing at home. So we teach nutrition in action. We also teach them to use the tools itself. Um, that's right, I give teenagers knives. Um, even though Americans still enjoy cooking, we, reg we spend less than half of our time in the kitchen than we did in 1960. And even for families who regularly cook at home, students often have to work or do extracurricular activities, so preparing a meal isn't the family gathering that it once was. Another daily skill, skill that we address is personal finance. Within our classrooms, focus is placed on day-to-day -day management. Rather than um, a corporate budget or making a profit, we teach you how this is your income. This is how to make it last throughout the month and save and put away for a raining day. Um, and because arguing about money is one of the biggest indicators of divorce, you could say that learning to manage your money is an investment in your future happiness. But so is also carefully considering the traits that you want in a future mate and studying what makes relationships succeed or fail. Four years after taking a course on relationships, stu students showed an increased self-esteem, increased family cohesion, and decreased in a decrease in dating violence. Our programs allow a platform for a comprehensive sex ed, which we know results in fewer teen pregnancies. And while we don't want them to have babies now, most students will likely take on a parenting role sometime in the future. And because 85% of brain development occurs in the first five years, it's essential we, uh, we educate caregivers to be attentive and nurturing. Teenagers often provide the care for young children because they're cheap. Um, so children in our, our students in our class get to go beyond just the physical care to address social, emotional, and cognitive needs of children. Because high school, because childcare isn't just a high school job. With a vast majority of working parents requiring childcare, there's projected to be half a million new openings in early childhood education by 2018. And it's an important job. People who receive pre-K education are more likely to have happier marriages, own a home, have a steady career job, and make more over their lifetime. But last but not least, there's fashion. I'll be the first to admit that snow sewing isn't a life skill anymore. But it is a great place to integrate STEM because that's what apparel production is, soft lines engineering. It also is a great place to raise awareness about consumerism and ethical responsibility. This is Rana Plaza. Um, it is a large, it was a multi-tiered just factory that collapsed and it killed 1,129 low-wage workers the people who make our clothing. So it's a place to talk about what is the true cost of your clothing. Because that's what all this is about. It's helping raise a 
it's helping to raise a future generation to create their own content. I'm really not worried about the substance of FCS. That will continue to stay around. But when FCS disappears out of schools, what you lose is accessibility. Accessibility to people who can't afford to take a special class downtown or purchase books, videos, blogs, things like that. Even today, when you're talking about STEM and, and engaging young women, FCS can be a gateway into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. In particular, it can be a bridge for students of both genders who have already decided that they just don't do those things. So that's why we like to say that we at FCS, we are building up the STEM program. We, uh, but it, we can't do this in isolation. isolation. FCS has always intended to been, be an applied life science. So if you're listening today and you're not an FCS teacher, I'd encourage you to reach out to the one at your school building. Teach us a thing or two. We're, we're really good learners, and we'd love to get input with you. And some of my best things have been collaborative. All right. So that was kind of. Laura, do you lecture? Oh, I don't. Sorry. Explain yourself. OK, the thing I just shared right there was a design tool, and I feel like I didn't do as well. I was. I was pretty nervous, but I, um, it's called a Pecha Kucha, and it is 20 slides, each lasting 20 seconds long. It's on an automatic timer, so if you saw that I wasn't always synced up, um, there's a reason why I wasn't following my presentation as well as I could have been. But what it does, I enjoy it as a tool to force my students. Have you ever had students who just kind of like make a PowerPoint presentation and just read off of it to you? Yeah, I can't, I can't do that. I, I tell them all the time. I, I know how to read. Thank you. So the Pecha Kucha model, you don't have to do as long as I did. But what it does is it only allows them, you can use it any way you want, but it's meant to be a picture and very, very short on your text. And you can use it to encourage them to know what they're saying in advance, to have it timed out, to get very concise in their details. Um, if you want better examples than I just presented tonight, or today, is that me? Um, there is a Pecha Kucha group in Des Moines. Their next meeting is on March 21st. Um, and you can find it at pechacucha.org. Um, if you just search Pecha Kucha Des Moines, it'll take you to the page. But there's, they're always at fun places. I, um, I modified the one I just presented, and it didn't flow as well as I liked. But I presented in September at the Art Center. And so I, it's a great evening. You can go. You can have a glass of wine. You can watch. Um, there was a bunch of things that were presented that day. Do you remember what some? Yeah. And um, we found out about there is a fat, um, fats accumulating in the sewers underneath Europe, um, that they're worried that how they're going to get it out and that it might create congestion. We also learned about. Um, Crazy Horse, the Crazy Horse Monument, just a diversity of a lot of topics. And so those are really, really interesting people. Um, it, yeah, and it's global. Um, Pecha Kucha is global. This is just the Des Moines area. But the nice thing about the Des Moines area is I know as educators, sometimes it's hard to get outside of our education bubble. But when you go there, you get to meet people from all sorts of disciplines. I guarantee you, across the presentations, you'll meet somebody that you want to come up to afterwards and say, like, hey, how's it going? And you'll get some of those connections to guest speakers, people to come and talk to your class. Um, another tool that I really like to use for presentations, because I, again, I am one of those people that really can't stand, like, it's a big pet peeve, that they read off of presentations to me. Um, is I use Haiku Deck. Um, anyone in here used Haiku Deck before? Um, Haiku Deck is just a platform that emphasizes, um, again, it emphasizes the image rather than a lot of text. There is room for no notes here. Um, the nice thing is you can share a deck between people. So I give my students an assignment. This is just for small summative um, type work. Um, I might want them to teach on a chapter or topic. So what you're seeing right here, I have a, tap, a chapter when I teach fashion analysis and design called Findings and Trims. So these students were um, assigned the topic of closures. So I encourage them to be very picture rich and text poor. Um, and 
Specifically in finding and trims or anywhere at place you need to see the detail, this is a great place because you have terms like trapunto or passamentary that a lot of people don't know. And when you can see it visually, you can be like, ah, you don't need a lot of like definition. You need a picture worth a thousand words. So this is just some examples of what I've done with Haiku Dex. I have used it both in fashion and um, culinary arts when we're talking about cooking terms. I have students search for images. Um, the nice thing about it, you can Google search images to find Google images that are pre-existing, but you can also upload images. So this is an example of they really wanted to at this point, they wanted to explain the parts of a zipper, so there was a nice diagram in their book. They could grab a picture of it. They could upload it. It's part of their presentation. And that way, you know, for those kids who don't necessarily all read the book like we want them to, it's right there, and you can go over the different parts. All right. Um, one of my biggest things, how many people struggle with phones in the classroom? Just in general. I have gone through several phases in my, my 10 years. Um, I've gone from being like, no phones ever, put them away. Um, my husband uses something called cell phone apartments where they get to sit in a little shoe cubby in the wall. Um, I think my change in, my latest change in attitude came about two years ago when somebody said to me, they were born with this technology in existence. I still remember the first phone that I got in college. It, it didn't even flip yet. It was just a little box, and it wasn't even the most. It, um, it played snake. Um, every letter was a three digit, like beep, 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 beep. Texting was an amazing thing. But they are born already having the internet and all these things at their fingertips. So when you think about it, we sat around in waiting rooms, and we waited. We became comfortable with being bored. They're, they're a whole generation who doesn't have that same skill set. They're not even aware. And I, I will tell you today, even though I am comfortable being bored, if I have this thing on me, if I'm waiting for two seconds, it's amazing. I'm already checking a million things. So that really changed my philosophy of cell phones in the classroom, of the fact that they are going to be here. They're going to be here, or they're going to be here, and you know they're crotchly glowing because they're looking down at it. <laughs> um, so I've really started to embrace them as a tool instead. So I wanted to share with you some apps that I use just on an everyday basis. Some of the, them you may already be familiar with, but maybe um, the way that I use them might spark a new idea for you, and some of them might be new for you. Um, the first one I wanted to share, does anyone have a QR code reader on their phone? OK, anyone else? All right, I'm going to hand this to you. You flip this puppy over and scan it and see what you get. Oh, anybody else? QR code reader oh, yeah. on your phone. So what I did this, this was a pretty simple activity. This is just a daily activity. This is not, um, I think I just used summative wrong before. <laughs> um, but this is just a formative activity. Um, in this particular instance, I was teaching about the um, 10 recommended NAEYC centers in an early childhood classroom. I could put them up on a PowerPoint. I do have a PowerPoint. It has pictures. It has words. I could go through them one by one by one. But that's not how I can best engage my students. So what I did is I just found images of like an aerial view of early childhood classrooms. I didn't even check if they were perfect or not. I just took that aerial view, and I uploaded them as the background in Padlet. Um, then I made a QR code on the back just to make ease of access to it, but you could also go through the steps of having them log into Padlet, find your Padlet, things like that. The QR code was just easy, ease of accessibility. But when students are on there, I was like, all right, in your group, you're going to label this early childhood center. You're going to say some materials that are typically found here. You're going to talk about skills that children develop in this area. And one thing that you might not really realize about blank center is and, and as you can see, like I took off all the um, comments that had student names associated with them. But as you can see, they got a chance to 
highlight different areas, talk about it. Um, if the area didn't exist in the photo, I encourage them to put it in there anyway and say like, hey, what do you think? Why is this missing? What would that mean for this early childhood center? Um, this is one of the, I have three room layouts, but it's really easy to add more depending on the si class size. I wanted about like, I think about two to three kids in a group work pretty functionally well. Anything more than that, somebody falls off and doesn't get their work done. Um, but I, I like to use this a lot of time for just little, let them do the work, the learning, things like that. Um, another way that I use phones in my classroom, has anyone heard, uh, this is not new or cutting edge, but who has used today's meet? Today's meet is just a place where you can have like a group chat. Um, so you set up your room, and I don't, I don't pay for anything, so I don't have access to these transcripts after a week. But for up to a week, I have access to these transcripts. What I found them really, really useful for is there's times I want to show educational videos, but I always struggle with educational videos because it seems like oh, I have to either make a worksheet or I have to do this or you have to answer questions. Otherwise, the kids are like not paying attention to it at all because it's movie time. Do you remember when you were like a kid and the TV wheeled in and it was like the best day of your life? It's not like that anymore. They're like, oh, movie time. It's time to like get on Facebook and chat with all my friends. And it totally misses them. And I don't blame them. I, I find myself doing that at home too. But I needed a way to engage them. So this lets you text, but in my group, to me, back and forth. So we usually set up some parameters around the room. Um, it usually has a code. So this one was my uh, child development preschool room. This is when we were watching a happy documentary. I have a movie called In the Womb. And then I just kind of label them things I understand. Um, I have all kids register and sign in with their name. And then I usually start it out. Before I start the movie, I ask a question like, what's your favorite color? And then just see if I get all my responses. I go around to check with students. Are you struggling to get on? Because um, I found it's really, really hard to have this up on your phone and be responding into this room and be texting and doing 10 million other things at the same time. So you can easily tell when a student's engaged or not. The other place that I found this one particularly good for, if you've ever had that class where you just don't have anyone who will talk. Have you had that? Like, there's just, you talk, you were like, ask a question and it's just silence. Or you have one kid and that's the only kid who ever talks. Somehow, like, you can put your thoughts out on typing in a way that some ways you might be afraid to speak up with them. And so this is, if I'm just having one of those classes that are really, really reluctant, I make it quiet day. And we get on and we text one another. Um, I started that as using that, but what I found is, so I can be, I usually do this on my laptop while they're all doing it on their phones. They might ask me questions and I can quickly link to other content. I can bring the, the link back in and they can see like, we were watching In the Womb and they asked me like, what happens if the, bra the baby's brain doesn't close completely? So I Googled, I don't remember the medical term for that, but hey, that's the power of the internet. I don't have to remember the medical term for that anymore. I Googled the medical term for that. I found out the answer to them. I, I connected the link in our conversation and they got to see it right away. And I don't know, they just are, I found like when I banter back and forth with them and just make the learning fun, they actually are a lot more engaged with it than answer this question. And I can throw a question that I want that I would have been on the worksheet out and get them to answer and respond back to it in a much more authentic way than they did before. Um, OK, so now we get to use the little thing that you downloaded. So if you have Blipper, did anyone get Blipper downloaded? All right, I'm going to. All right, I'm going to give it to these three tables. So if you want to just kind of Can I, use anybody here, have it. You want to join them? Or you want to join these guys? Would you come up and join these guys because you have your blipper? Okay. I'm going to you you put get it right it yet? here. And, and you can just Bring come stand by it if you have it on your you phone. Grab that if you grab that picture, sir, oh, right behind you. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, sure. So you scan the card. 
So if you have Blipbar open and you have my code, has anyone gotten a successful scan of it yet? Okay. Blipbar is augmented reality. So when you are creating a Blipbar, you upload a trigger image and um, the trigger image needs to be high resolution, but you can see like, oh, these just look like the topics that I'm educating about. When you scan, what comes up for you? Yeah, those are buttons, and those buttons open up different links. So when I have a topic that there's already a lot of information or internet resources for, I found out that this was a really, really good way to make them go get the knowledge. Um, these six posters I actually put up around the school, and I actually have scavenger hunt um, clues for, and they are on teams, and they get a race around, and they're trying to find out who's going to finish first. But I have my questions that I already know that I want answered. The information, I don't match the information to my questions. I have my questions determined beforehand, and I link to information that provides that and more because I'd like them to be able to look and filter for the information that they're looking for. You're welcome to move around. Yeah, if you want to see any of the other ones. If you haven't seen it yet, move to somewhere that is so that you can. Well, and the reason I like this in throwing problems out there is parenting isn't a handbook. They can't just give you a baby handbook and have all the problems that you will ever face with your child. And sometimes you could learn about problems that you may or may not face. So really, I think it's important that they know how to search for answers to problems in future if they should encounter them. I guess the other thing is that the reason I love my daughters is they're willing to share, but they're willing to share with other people too. And so for the price of the, um, the copies, you know, the color copies and the laminating, that's what mom did. She did the techno stuff, <laughs> okay? And so then I can use it in my classroom, but it could be used in other classrooms as well. Can you find some ways that you could use this blipper? We had another program we used first, and then they decided they would start selling the yeah. subscription to, so we had to eliminate that. Well, I heard somebody said layer. 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 That's that was, was my first one that I used, and then it used to be available for free. You just had to deal with a pop-up ad, and then recently, they might have gone back, but recently they changed to being paid. And I don't know with some of these companies, they offer you educational pricing, but I don't know what they think that teachers make. <laughs> More than we do. Uh, when I was making my sub plans for today, I used a Nearpod because it had student paste, but student paste went away. But I could become a gold member for only $10 a month, and that would be fine, except you had to pay it all up front. I wasn't going to pay $120 for my students to do one activity. Yeah, I do want to share this. Okay. When you get that place. Okay. So we have a lot of business teachers here. Are there any ways that business could use this? Okay, I guess we get to set up a uh, group meet. A group meet. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk. No, it's okay. Yeah, we could ask. Well, I can show you, um, too, if you're thinking he's about... Good. Oh. He's good. The microwave. Oh, yeah. Hey! Yeah. Business teachers, you want to share some of the ways that you might use Blip R? Um, we've, used, we've used Layer, mm -hmm. but, which Same is very thing. similar. And we um, used it in a personal finance class, mm -hmm. and we had them go through an activity where they had to analyze different credit cards, what were the advantages Ooh. of different credit cards, um, what was their advertising gimmick that they were trying to get in? What were some of the hidden components? So we had them have an activity. You could give them all the links on a PowerPoint, like she said, but the minute you get them up and moving, up and moving it's amazing the engagement that exists. So we, 
um, we use this in our social studies classes. We've used it in um, in our marketing classes to identify marketing ads and like what um, what element of the marketing mix they're trying to target. So we. We've, we've done layer a little bit more, but I've never used the blipper, so that'd be interesting. I, I really just bounce back and forth between the one that I can find that's free for me. Um, this is another one called Orisma. Um, and then what I use this for, I teach an interpersonal relationships class, and really I want them to delve into their personality, understanding, and, and truly create, like identity is a major developmental stage in the teenage years. And it's really, really difficult, but it's one of those important things to wrestle with. So in an interpersonal relationship, we're really trying to find out who your personality is, what are your morals, values, beliefs, how have they changed, um, or how are they yours personally beyond what you've just been, beyond the ones you've been raised with. Um, so these were um, student uploaded photos that then they went in and they added um, trigger things to. Um, I also uploaded one of mine because I was gone on the first day. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been gone on the first day, and I was like, how am I going to introduce myself to my kids? So I left um, a, a big printout poster of me. Oh, that's a side note. Did you know if you have a black and white photo, you can go to Staples or Office Max and ask them to print it on, it has to be high resolution, but they can, you, they can print it on their plotter printer, and you can get huge poster size quality black and whites. Like, they're really pretty cool. So I changed my, and cheap, like, yeah, um, I think. The big size of it was $5, yeah. Um, and so I left a lot of things about me on my things, and my kids could go through the links and get my reasonings explanation. It was a good way to get to know me before I, and when I couldn't be there. Um, but my students also did it part of theirs. Layers one. Oh, I was going to say, um, my husband is an English language arts teacher. They use it with their choice books. Um, so when you scan the cover, you get a review from another student about the book or recommendations from other students about the book. And it's really, really good because when your choice books, when you're making selections for choice books, you're just one teacher. You can't be going everywhere. And so it's nice to have other student recommendations. So that's kind of like they read the book and then they have to leave a recommendation. And they eventually collect a lot on the book covers. Um, Oh, oh, I was going to explain. If you are interested in doing something like this, my um, biggest recommendation is just organization before. So what I did is I picked my image before, and then you need a series of buttons. Buttons are what you saw, the little icons that you clicked on. And then I also started a, um, this is just a Word doc of all the files that I'm linking to. And that, it just helped me have my ducks in a row because we all know that links will go bad just randomly when you don't want them to. Huh. I think um, mychoice.org had a, suffered from the whole shutting down of government corporations. And I know that left a lot of health, food, and nutrition teachers out of the loop for a little while there. But this is just a way that if one link goes bad, I can quickly, or, or if it just gets corrupted, I can go back there. I can maybe like search, like, OK, maybe it's the tail end of the link has changed, so I can find it, remember it. And that is what also um, enabled me. Like, I built the first one on Layer, and then Layer became paying. And I was like, I'm not going to pay for that. So then I went to um, Blipper. I've, I've floated around between all three because it's it's not the intensive build that it was the first time because I had all the steps there. So that's one way that I'd recommend for it to be. I'm going to transition off to you. Yeah. So Laura um, creates a lot of her own things, but I, I, on the other hand, find that when I'm creating things, I can spend three hours creating um, a quiz, a lit, or I can do a lot of spendy expenditure of time and the kids get through it in about 43 seconds. Anybody else feel that way? So on the learning curve, I'm just a little bit the other direction. Uh, so with my Carl Perkins money, with most people that are uh, business, FCS, or ag, you might have some Carl Perkins money. I purchased this um, subscription, and so I have it for the next three years, and it's called my ICEV. And what I like about this is I can create courses, okay? So uh, I don't use it in every course. I have 
Um, Laura has smaller classes. I have huge classes. I take a maximum of 30 people in my food one classes. And then I have half the kids cooking at one time and half of them engaged in other activities. Um, my smallest class is uh, 14, and that's my housing and interior design class. And so I range the, quite the gamut, but I, in a, a typical semester, I have 183 kids, I think. I teach seven, I teach seven periods. I did want to add that that is where that, sometimes we do the half, like if you ever have something where you don't want all the kids doing the activity because you have limited resources and materials, that is a place where these padlets and these augmented realities can work pretty well because we have half the kids going at one time when we want to watch their individual skills. We might do group labs when we're just practicing a skill, but that this is a way that they can stay engaged, stay focused and not, you know, the first line of behavior management is giving them something to do. Yeah, so Laura is standards-based. I am still grade-based points, those kinds of things. Um, Laura comes from Waukee School where you have, I think, a total of six FCS teachers from 9 through 12. Um, I'm from Ames High School, which isn't that much smaller, and we have one high school teacher in FCS. And so I try to be the master of all and, and you know, N nothing, you know. So I, I did subscribe to this. The first year I asked for a pilot and they gave it to me free. And so you might try that first because they're trying to get the word out. But it is a place where you can develop courses and here you can see, um, I should make this bigger for you a little bit bigger. Um, so I have child development, uh, advanced foods and interior design and housing. Uh, but I'm going to show you something a little more global, which is entrepreneurship, where the business people might um, like to see. But what you can do is you can view the course. They have some courses they, sub they suggest to you. And then you decide when and where you turn it on and off. So let's say. Um, you are going to do an entrepreneurship class and you want this uh, part they call a job defined of entrepreneur. And the CC stands for closed caption. I can view this lesson, okay. It has usually either a video or PowerPoints already created for it. And so you can see that uh, this one uh, we'll just watch it a little bit. We're not going. We're, uh, but it taught. It has a lot of footage that I couldn't create on my own. Okay, and uh, I like that. So if you ever want to uh, look at that, um, I can help you. It also has many activities, projects, uh, vocab hand handouts that you could print, but the only two things on this one was cutting edge and entrepreneur. Um, then it also has assessments. And so the, what I like is I can turn on or off the assessments, and they're usually five to 10 questions. And so we'll just do this um, assessment on entrepreneur. They have to do some of the, um, the work that uh, in there, and then they just take, uh, according to Greg, which of the following should an entrepreneur expect from his or her job, um, you know, I don't know, which one? We'll see if that's right. Which does not, I don't know, this one. I mean, I'm just guessing right now because I'm just, I'm just doing this. I don't even know, I haven't watched this one. And last but not least, take no as an answer. So I can finish it and I submit my activity and then it says, ooh, for guessing I got two out of five right. Do you see what I'm saying? Then as a teacher, the thing I like about it is that when I assign something like this, I might have something else that's going on that I have to keep my eye on or I'm suffering from a cold or things like that. Um, I can look at any moment and see who's completed what um, assessments and I can also see how much time they took on it. Uh, so if they repeated the assessment, I can see that too. So I like this. I don't uh, grade them. I do more of a you know, skills base for testing in other ways and stuff. But I do like this. Um, you can customize it. You can tell it which programs you want to uh, do. You can see there's um, 
common core standards, all kinds of things with this. And so I consider it a toolbox that I can share with the students. That's how I use it. You know what I'm saying? And so like if I don't, uh, if I have multiple um, groups of advanced foods and I don't want to get a side of beef in, I can have uh, the thing on how they cut up a side of beef. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's videos and stuff that I couldn't access um, all the time on my own. So I just wanted to share that um, because I find it a helpful little tool. I do a lot with Google Docs, Google Forms, and the spreadsheets and things, and I also ask them to do a lot with those because I think that's things that they will use in their life. Um, let me, I'm just going to finish up, do you have the, yeah. mm -hmm. sorry. Um, she already mentioned Google Docs and Google Forms. I was just going to tag on with, um, I am standards-based grading, and when you're transitioning to there, one of the biggest challenges um, is truly that, how do you report it in the gradebook pieces? It, I'm going to check out your thing because that sounds awesome to me. Um, but. I was struggling for, yes, I have multiple points of assessment, but how do I look at them all together without like paging this way and paging back and paging this way and paging back from all my students and all my students? And when you do have classes of 30 and you get a grade book that has a bunch of assignments, that can be challenging. Um, one of the very first ways that I did that was Google Docs. Um, we're all familiar with Google Docs, uh, and we use it a lot to collaborate with colleagues, but I've started using it with students, so I make a, a the base one, and then I share it with all my students, and then I walk them through how to make a copy. They make a copy, share it back with me, title it their name, and then they can upload things to it. Like these are my um, eight sewing, my eight standards that I cover in fashion construction, and these are the levels of mastery of it. And they're just, they just know the link, they have this link on their phones all the time, so in the middle of sewing, they're like, okay, I just showed a pivot. Okay, stop, take a picture, put it up, and then they comment on it and talk, um, and it becomes more of a conversation between us. Since then, I've moved on to Google Classrooms, which I really, really like for the fact that um, sewing, sewing is just a very hands-on class. And I tell you, when you start, it's like you take a cue number and your cue number never ends. For the 90 minutes, you're just like, problem, problem, okay, there's, the surgery's down, and, and this is my whole time. And in 90 minutes, I just never felt like I got a chance to teach a lesson. Um, this really helps me flip it because I can load up um, different videos. I can do forms, quizzes with Google Forms. It um, asks them the questions. I can see who's done and not done it. And then it groups it again by my standards, and I can go in and see it by students. So um, it's a great place also to share project directions, because sometimes when I, I can demo a skill one time, but then I can guarantee you like somebody wasn't watching, or they forgot, or they forgot an important set. So anytime I can link to a video and go, OK, go visit that video and see that first, and then mm -hmm. come ask me, that helps me a lot. Um, the thing I'm not as excited about, I don't know, how many people use Google Classrooms? I, it doesn't let me have that standards reference part, so I have to assign a point total. So I had to just become familiar with the point totals I was referencing with each grade. And so that part is a little clunky for me. But I really did like the fact that I could upload and link to different things. Um, yeah, so let's take a little break. We'll set up, if you Ten want, minutes. yeah, come look at, um, we're going to share the pancake bot next, so come look at some of the creations. Yeah, we're going to uh, do some technology things here so that are not on via computer. So. Hey, everyone, Maybe we're going like, to have you sit down. You uh, she's going to instruct on the pancake bot, and then you can see it in action and probably test out some of the pancakes, I imagine. That would be. Hmm? Yeah, you're welcome to pull up a chair and just. So we'll have you take a seat. Carol will share some things about the pancake bot and then we'll we'll see it in action. Okay, so um, 
I was trying to think of the ways that I could compete with the industrial technology people with their, they have several 3D printers. And then uh, the art department got a 3D printer and everybody was playing with their 3D printers and I wasn't. Um, uh, but it really didn't come to fruition until the day after we came back from winter break. And I do a little uh, techno, uh, I do food trends with my advanced foods kids. And so I was showing them some video footage of food trends for this coming year. And they, um, they had the pancake bot on here. And they also had other 3D printers. And you can use 3D printers right now to print pasta. Barilla has a pasta printer. Uh, so they take a slurry of semolina, just like you do for spaghetti and they will do that so what that was one of the links on your thing they also have 3d printers which i would love to have one for chocolate but that has to has the additional feature that you have to keep the chocolate warm and flowing so i decided that the most i could afford was the 3d printer for pancake batter because it's easy to make it's easy to uh, replenish it's not like something i have to buy a mix or a kit or something like that so I uh, purchased it, and then uh, unfortunately I got the whatever was going around the school last week, and so then I didn't get to unbox it till this week. But what we find with the pancake batter uh, bot, it was working really good yesterday, and so I don't know. I've got a little overrun and things like that, but it made really crisp lines, and we ran it, I think, from second period all the way through eighth period. Not that the, every class had that as a thing, but I kept talking about the, the way they could start designing logos and stuff. And so uh, with the Pancake Bot, there's software that you can use to create your own designs. Like she's making the little uh, Pancake logo here right now of this little Timmy the, the ape. And you can change, you can draw your own designs, you can import images, you could uh, make your school logo, your DECA logo, you could make uh, the FFA. Maybe you don't want to go with the whole FA, FFA crest with all the little details, but you could do some of those kinds of things. Um, and pancakes are cheap. Pancakes are cheap, you know. So, so this is the uh, program pancake painter that you would go to. The darkest line is, of course, the lines you lay down first. And so a lot of times your outlines are the darkest lines. And then the lightest color is the lightest or the last batter you lay down. However, you can buy an accessory kit with more bottles. And that allows you to, in the 35 seconds it gives you, you can trade out colors. And so if you know the program or you develop the program intimately yourself, you could trade out colors and do that. Let me tell you a little bit about the ins and outs of it because I want to give enough time for Laura. You have to make your batter. It has to be a little bit thinner. And you have to strain your batter. Now, when we teach pancake making, we say, oh, a few lumps isn't bad in pancakes. You don't want to create the gluten over you know, over stir it to make the gluten. And here's an example of just straining the batter. It's got all kinds of little lumps in it, even though we mixed it up well. And so you really have to strain it. The first time I didn't, I, uh, I just was so excited. I filled all the bottles and then I had a little bit of clunkiness in it, you know, because it plugs up and it's just a little bitty. Um, it's like a cake decorating tube. It's a little bitty thing. As long as the um, as long as the pressure tube is attached, it usually doesn't drip. Okay, and then it has a griddle. The griddle is you you can take the griddle right out of it. And so the when you take the griddle out of it, you can clean. It's very easy to clean up and things like that. Um, what's your next favorite? So the pancake batter has to be a little bit thinner. Let's do this one. More like a crepe. More like a crepe batter. Consistency. But you don't have to add any special things. 
Then you hook up the air tube, which is the pressure that it puts into the bottle. That's what we're having a little bit of problem with today, is it's, it's pressure a little. And then you go over to the side panel and you choose what design you want to make. If you create a design yourself, you put it on an SD card and the SD card is saved and put on to your computer. So then it just gives you a scroll down menu of the things that you're um, able to do. Right now I have 25 designs loaded on there. And again, because different people join this community and then they uh, upload their designs, you don't know until you start printing what this design is going to be like. What are you going to print right now? Flower. Okay, so we're going for the flower right now. And sometimes I find that after the flower uh, gets going that I would just like to fill it in myself. And so we've gone to the old ketchup bottle and then you just fill it in very quickly. We also figured out that you don't have to, you know, heat the whole pancake batter on this griddle. You can move it over to the other griddle and do the other side. Um, we think it's working great. Our kids are super excited. I can't tell you how excited the special needs kids are. I have a Pure Foods class, and they were just like, I want the Wonder Woman logo. And there's a really, I mean, there's really interesting detailed ones like Einstein and, and all kinds of different places. If you just go on to this Pancake Bot um, website, you can look up under the designs. There's lots of designs. And so she's just putting in some, um, pinkish there with the, the yellow. But like now that we know this, we could probably outline the whole, um, the whole pancake in, uh, in, the, in the green and then just add the flower colors just because. But you can have it totally filled in by the pancake bot, okay? Um, some things that we do, we mix up four batches at a time. I don't believe in this kind of detailed to uh, leave it to chance. Um, so we weigh the flour, okay? So that's a good thing for your students to do is weigh the flour and using um, you know, specific things. Do you know the old fashioned coffee filters that went into um, coffee makers? I use those all the time for uh, weighing ingredients because they're cheap and they have a little cup shape to them. So you just sit it right on there and then you weigh your ingredients. And then also, um, we also use the infrared uh, thermometer to check the temperatures of our, our, um, our griddle. I don't like it to be as hot as I normally make pancakes on. So even though pancakes are usually made at 375, this is only running about 290.1 degrees. Okay, so the infrared thermometer is another thing that it's just a little piece of technology that they can get used to what temperature is going around here. Um, the milk is not as warm or cool as it used to be. That milk has been sitting out since this morning, 66 degrees. So, you know, uh, just kind of things that they can learn. Um, some caveats, I would say it was a $300 investment, $42, plus they told me to buy an SD card, and then it came with an SD card. So we're on Pancake Bot, the two, um, the second version of it. Um, again, my kids say $300 to make pancakes, and I equate it, it to the first calculator I bought in college was $99.99, and it added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided. And now you can do the same thing with a dollar calculator. And so I think this will go down in price, but I also think that it's fun to have an emerging, emerging technology that they can design. Okay, and it's also that you don't have to have a lot of plastic things sitting around that you created with a 3D printer. 3D, is it really 3D? Well, I think if you got four crisp Eiffel Towers, you could probably frost them together. I consider it kind of 2D because it's making just two dimensions in my mind, but it also is edible, so you, you know, can enjoy the results and stuff like that. And we're looking forward to, we're going to try to make um, see what other things will work yeah. in it. Um, we're thinking if we don't have the griddle underneath to cook it, right. if you could make molten chocolate and then have it like design intricate designs for like desserts and 
things like that. So. so some of my spring break projects, I think that should come to the very far end and make like a whole bunch of stars, maybe a row of hearts, maybe a, th a row of other kinds of designs that I could fill in quickly and then flip over to this other one so that I could make tool for um, uh, desserts, you know, the little cookie that you put on top of a dessert. I would also like it to do like two or three images at a time and that would be a, another thing that I want to work with, plus our school logo, uh, plus any organization. We have lots of school um, kids that do pancake um, fundraisers, like we had a dance marathon. They could have it out as the thing for kids to watch while they're waiting for their pancakes, you know. Um, I, I would encourage you to buy one because uh, just the little, the problem that we're having right here, I think, is just a fact where we're here you know how when you have the perfect thing it works great and stuff it it may be I have a little bit to thin the batter down but it works really good and so you can you're welcome after we get done to come up and play with it okay and I hope you'll enjoy uh, that kind of thing I think kids like new things at least in my classroom they really really do I'm going to share with you um, a silhouette. A silhouette cameo is a cutting tool. Um, you might be familiar with crickets. Um, the thing, the big advantage that I like about the silhouette cameo is um, it was the first of its kind to not need to use cartridges. I am very much an independent. I don't want to spend $40, $40, $40, $40 to have this font and that font. I want to design my own stuff, and I want my own stuff to be created. So the Silhouette Cameo was the first that offered us that opportunity. Um, if you guys are down with it, I thought we could design a shirt for Issa together so you could see it in action. So before Issa left, she told me she likes dogs. So we got a bunch of dogs here. What is, what do you, which dog do you think Issa would like? Um, just to show, uh, just to explain a little bit, um, what we're going to use is a trace feature. So what I've filtered it out for is a large, um, so that it won't get a pixelated image, and a black and white high contrast image. I have used um, images that aren't just black and white, but I get good results on a black and white image. So, anyone got somebody? What? Pick first one. This guy. Okay. So we're going to go. We're going to save, coloring pages actually make pretty good ones. Oh, wow, that is a very large file format. That's good. And I'm just going to drop it on my desktop. Then we open up the software. I've opened it up in advance. The one thing that you will find is it takes about a good it probably only takes a minute to open, but a minute is like five minutes in my world. So um, we're going to design a new one. We're going to pull in, oh, actually, we're just going to open. Oh, well, hey, you know what? Um, we're going to go with it. That is not our dog. But we're going to go up here to trace and trace the area. And then you can play around with a high pass, low pass. But basically, every, you want all the area that you want to be traced cover, colored in with yellow. Um, I might go trade this one out later before I actually make her shirt because I don't want the lines around the dog. I just want a dog with a, a transparent background. Sometimes I pull it into other files to make the background transparent before I do this. But then we trace. And those are our cutting lines for a dog. Now, if I did want to go with this, you can go and you can edit the points, which I do a lot of times. Oh, not like that. And you can get it back down to the dog. You can also make text in here and do a lot of different things. So, Lisa. And then we could change the file format of that. So I will play around with that um, a little bit later to finalize it. Um, oh, well, I, you probably do want to see it cutting in action. So I'm going to go with this that I've already made. I made this image before. Um, I, took a, an, I, I took a Iowa as an outline. 
um, I traced Iowa, and then there's an offset feature. So then I offset a line off of it, the outside to the inside. Um, I overlaid a heart, um, and then removed the overlap to create a black and white image to create high contrast, combine them together. I made Ed, and then Education, the Heart of Iowa. If I were going to cut, the silhouette cuts out a lot of things. It can cut out paper, it can cut out cardstock, it can cut out vinyl, so like the decals you see on the back of cars. That's what a lot of my students enjoy using them for. They like to design their own logos as part of businesses, and then they get to make their logos, and they get to stick it on things. Um, it can also cut off what is cut out what is called heat transfer material. Um, heat transfer material used to be an industry only available thing, um, and now you can get it for yourself. If you're going to use a heat transfer material like we're going to use, you have to reflect it to go backwards. So we'll move that one out. can also group objects to help them make them be easier to move, but yeah, I've got a lot of copies going on here. Well, it's fine. Only what's on my thing counts. So we're going to move Ed into that. And then you have a mat with low tack that you stick it onto. Oh yeah, this is probably where we could transition to the actual viewing of the If we got the camera, this would be. How many of you have a silhouette or some other kind of paper? One person. Do you love it? I love it all the time. Um, uh, we have three women in my, our family, and we each have one now. And we have one at school, too. Well, so. and it's amazing. I got it for being um, textiles and apparel. I could see a lot of applications. But ironically, I do a lot of things for people outside of that. Um, I will tell you what I'm doing right now. Don't. I normally have a paper cutter and I cut it to the right amount before. This is wasteful. Don't, don't watch me. So then we're going to take it to the machine. There are some arrows here. And you want to center your mat in between the arrows. This machine can also cut just the material itself. Um, but like anything, it's moving something in and out of this kind of central area. And so if it gets off a little bit, you want to make sure that both before and um, both sides of the machine are clear. So the longer the material, the less stabilization you have, the more risk you have of error. So I like the cutting mats, but you can do it without. All right. Um, I don't know. Can we toggle back to the computer just one second and then go back again? Sorry. You're going to go up here to the cut settings. Um, they have a lot of materials preloaded. Um, this one is a heat transfer uh, glitter material. Um, I had to invent that category, but I went online and got a lot of user feedback to determine my settings. So once you click on that, um, you can have a lot of options. You set what you want the blade depth to be, and then how fast and how thick it cuts. Don't do that. Don't do that. There's a little tool to do that. forgot it at home. OK. And if we, um, well, I'm going to unplug so I can go over here to the USB plug-in. I'm not as much into textiles, but I've labeled uh, the kitchen cabinets. And so the kids can find certain things. I have, like, Sorry. knives cooking equipment, stirring equipment, measuring equipment. Um, so, you know, I peel these off and then stick them on the cabinets because my cabinets are 60 years old, so I don't care. So, you know, it says measuring equipment and things like that. And then uh, I even put little containers that I have, um, chocolate chips and stuff like that in. So I just, I label up a lot of things, but the students also like to make the labels and that kind of thing, logos. All right, I'm going to fast forward you here. It's cutting here. And what you'll get is you'll get a solid image. And then you have to weed out the areas that you don't want. So it comes with this little tool 
or if you can't find it, a little straight pin works just fine because I'm always putting this down somewhere. And we're gonna, you can weed it out everywhere. Um, it can be applied with an iron. Um, I do have this shirt press. This is not clearly the latest and greatest. I think this is maybe like 35 years old, I'm not sure. Um, but it is nice because you don't want steam or water heat, you want a dry iron to be able to apply this. The steam will create bubbles. Um, anyone in here wear a unisex size medium? Medium? Anybody want a t-shirt for medium? All right, it's yours. Okay. So I'm going to find the center line. Just make a finger crease. Fold this in half to make a center crease. And I lay it down so I can see where my finger press center line was before. Lay it down. This is beautiful in that it already times 30 seconds for me, but if you were doing it with an iron, you just wanna, you wanna press, not iron. Press holds the iron still and then picks it up and moves it to a new place. Ironing is when you move it back and forth. Um, but this one gets the hole at once and it's gonna beep at me. So then once that happens, you're able to peel this off, it's there, and I just press one more time. Um, the thing that this, like my design students really like it because they get to create their own designs, their own logos, but the other thing I found it's really good is for a lot of student groups want t-shirts with a very, very, very small limited run and then you, the prices are exorbitant. So this material isn't, um, it isn't as cheap as vinyl, but when you compare it, like I think you can get this image maybe cost 75 cents, a dollar, if you use it wisely. So, happy shirt. This machine only cuts to a certain thickness. There is another machine that you can buy that cuts thicker materials, so it can cut um, very thin wood. Um, if you're interested in anything like that, what I can recommend is is anyone familiar with Area 515 downtown? Mm -hmm. Have you been? Yeah. They are my new friends. Um, Area 515, if you aren't familiar, is a maker space in um, downtown Des Moines. Their website is area515.org. Um, it does cost $40 a month to be a member, but they have open house on Wednesday evenings, so you could go see if you're interested in it all. Um, I actually found out about them with the next project that I'm gonna tell you about, and they were having a, wor a workshop class. It just happened to be I couldn't figure out the programming for this thing, and they were having a workshop the night of, so I was able to go um, figure it out. But um, one of the fun things that they have is they have a laser cutter. You do have to get trained on it, but it was a painless process. I spent a Sunday afternoon there, and now I have access to a machine that um, I could never afford. <laughs> Even with grant money, I would never be able to really justify the cost of one, but this does um, laser cuts on wood, plexiglass, um, other materials, and you can have very intricate um, designs. If you plan it well enough, you can make 3D sculptures out of them. You can make boxes. And like the pancake box, when people create this stuff, they share the files, the SVG files, and they become like, people are just like, it's this whole collaborative community of creators, and I love it so much. Um, and it just helps people um, develop and make more. Um, the project that I went to Area 515 originally for um, was in my textiles and apparel class. I started to experiment with sewn circuits. There are a bunch of places that you can find one. This sewn circuit um, makes a faux camera where the light blinks on and off with the <laughs> press of a button. And I wanted to give my students a chance to do that. Um, there is, um, like this is a really cool application of the um, whole wearable textiles. So this one is a vest that you can wear when you are bicycling and when you make a hand gesture, it, it, it makes a blinker on your back so people know whether you're turning left or right. Um, it's, 
it's a lot um, safe. This is my, we first experimented with simple circuits to just um, make LED lights. So I have, I have a little light up skirt that just gets two little pocket batteries. It's washable. Um, I just pop the batteries out and they can go through the wash. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, here. Well, no, I'm going to go. If, can I go on the document camera next? OK. Um, so just to show you what one looks like, this is our school shirt. And we took it, and we just, um, one of the easiest ways to do this, uh, LED lights have two prongs, and then you have to make sure to be aware which one is the positive and the negative one, and always line them up with the positives going on one continuous line and the negatives going on another continuous line. Um, but the way I was able, some people use embroidery hoops. What I found was really nice um, is a piece of styrofoam. So I just stabilized the back of my um, thing and then I used the styrofoam to like, almost like a light bright. I pressed the prongs down in them and then I flipped them over. And when you flip it over, you'll have the prongs sticking out the back. But then you take um, a little, they're like jewelry pliers. I, ah, guys, I'm going to bomb. I don't know the actual term for these. They're, they're my tools. I, I have a whole little sewing kit for just stuff now. Um, but you use uh, a pliers like this and you bend the wires down. You roll it down until it gets to the base of the fabric. And then we took um, conductive thread. Um, we actually bought, the reason they're on bobbins is you can get, like they, there are people who sell these kits. Um, but you can find, if you look at the individual materials, you can find the individual materials a lot cheaper on Amazon. So we just bought a big cone of conductive thread and I wound bobbins and then every student had their own because they were all designing their own thing too. Um, we hand sewed because uh, a traditional sewing machine, first of all, we're not sure that something this thick is going to fit through the eye of the needle, but it's also a lock stitch machine which creates an intersection at every thread, and that might interrupt the connectivity and flow. Um, so you sew your two circuits. The positive one is going around the outside, and the negative one is going on the inside. Um, one thing that I did find out is a single stitch like I used here is not the best for conductivity. I, I'll show you a project in a little bit that has a better stitch. It's a chain stitch. Um, but. I have, a, I have a nice glowy walkie, and when I go to basketball games, you know who I am. <laughs> Upside. It looks oh. better in real life. It's kind of like a yeah. neon purple. Yeah. Um, so the next phase of this is that, so this is a, a chain stitch, um, and then the stitches loop on each other, and that's a lot better. The connectivity here is a lot better. Um, but what we have here is a lily pad. Um, it's by Arduino. Arduino is a company that really makes accessible programming. Um, I am not a computer programmer, and I knew enough to understand the programming of this twinkle. So that was, that was huge for me, because I just like to make and create. Um, this pad can tell your lights to do things. So in this little sample that I was working on, these lights twinkle like that. So if you could imagine a whole skirt of that, that's what some of my students are working on with tool or things like that. Um, the applications are much more than just lights. You can make sounds. You can program yourself to have a playable like t-shirt. Um, you can make your clothing um, responsive so that if like the temperature changes, your shirt does something, or if you press a button, it does something else. Um, but up to this point, like wearable technology existed mostly for me on YouTube and just making my students aware of it. And this was a really, really great way to like, hey, you can try some out for yourself. You can experiment some for yourself. Price. Um, price. Oh, um, the most expensive part about this was the Arduino itself. Um, I will say um, we found a good deal. Don't do that. We got 10 Arduinos that don't work because they're counterfeits. <laughs> and that's why we went to Makerspace because we were like, why won't it program? Why won't it program? And they, we finally figured out, yeah, they're, they're fake. Um, to just show you the difference.
This is the real one. This is the fake one. <laughs> no idea. I, I mean, my sister can tell the difference. I can't still to this day. I just, I'm going to put this back in the package, so. Yeah. Um, but the Arduino, um, it, it runs about 10 to 15 for a little pad like this, but you can do a lot of different things with it. Um, this one is obviously bigger and has more circuits that you can um, install. You do need a little micro USB to be able to hook it up to your computer and program, but the programming element itself is really, really easy to understand and explainable. They have tutorials that say like, hey, do you want to do this? This is where you insert the code. And that's what I liked about it. Like I didn't have to have a whole background in programming information to be able to use it. Um, my kids are really geeked out about it. They are getting excited. Um, as far as other price, like um, the batteries come packs um, really pretty inexpensive. We bought our LED bulbs in bulk and then I just sorted them out based on color. Um, you can get a lot of them on Amazon.com. I'm not recalling the price right now, but it is easier to break down the component parts and buy the individual pieces um, than it is a kit. That being said, if you've never done it before, um, a kit is a perfectly great way to do it. Um, I recently just soldered together a mint, an Altoid mint charging, like emergency charge for my phone, and I felt very, very proud of myself. And it was a kit, but I got the experience of soldering for the first time, and that was great. All right. Um, do you have any closing remarks? Well, do you guys have any questions about anything? The first two sessions, third. What do we do in our spare time? We try to get pick people. up new hobbies. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Anybody questions, or do everybody sleeping and can't wait to get out of here? Um, they, I'll, I'll show you half creations, because then we learned, like we learned and then we adapted and didn't keep on with the project. Um, this is, it's ultimately meant to be a mask that um, you can wear and lights up around the edges. Um, I find it's good to do a small project first because the learning curve on it was so much like as you were going, you're like, oh, okay, this makes sense. This doesn't make sense. And I was learning along too with them. Um, for example, this was one that is meant to say golf, G O L F. And then we figured out like we're going to have to run at least four different batteries because we can't line up all um, in one continuous row. Um, it does help to kind of map it out on a piece of paper and then try to use a marker to connect. Um, another one of my kids did a tool skirt that like twinkles like underneath all the layers of tool. Tool is really easy one to get it attached to because it's very, it's got big holes that you can stick the LEDs through. Maybe a question about how do you get started on like a shoestring budget? <laughs> what would you suggest? I mean, in terms That's, of getting started. I can show you my Amazon um, basket. <laughs> Um, on a shoestring budget, you just buy some LEDs and you buy um, connective thread. Um, I think the expensive part was, well, I don't know how expensive because I bought a big spool of the connective thread because I wanted to make sure all my students had it, but it was $35 for the connective thread. I think I pay about 5 to $10, depending on the color of LED lights, for 250 lights at a time. Um, and then, like you can see, I'm a, I'm a hoarder because I will re-bend these back out and use them again rather than throw them away. Um, and then you just, other than that, you just need a needle with a big enough eye to go through. Um, oh, and then the battery packs. Um, you can do a battery pack as simple or as, you can buy the battery packs, the advantages of them. So this was one battery pack. That's an example of one. This is an example of another one, a coin button. But you don't have to. If you're just starting up for the first time, um, this we used um, tin foil, um, and we one is coming out of one side of the battery and one is coming out of the other side of the battery, and then we wrapped it in washi tape. So if you put this in your garment and you sew through the tin foil, it connects it to. Um, the disadvantage of this is you can't pop the battery out, so you won't be able to wash this one. But but if it was like a hat or something, you'd fine. be fine. Yeah. I mean, you don't, oh, sorry, I, I've been, sh 
<laughs> so this is the coin battery, and um, it's connected on one side and the other, and you don't need a battery pack. Thank you for letting us have the opportunity to yeah, share. Thanks. Because we think FCS is hands-on. I mean, that's why. And kids if there's anything you guys want to, like, beyond questions, if there's anything you want to explore, I mean, we're wrapping up. But you guys can come look. I assume, can they come? Like, we don't have to get out of here? No. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Um, if, if you're an FCS teacher, hurrah for the <laughs> girls. If you're not, go make friends with one. And I know that we're not all the same, but I guarantee you, like, one of our, I don't know, do it as a personal favor to me. If your FCS teacher is not currently engaged in technology, go make friends with them and teach, show them a couple things because once they see the application, they will go crazy. So. All right, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, you do have time. We are ending a little bit early, so you do have time to come up and, and learn how all this stuff works. Also, you were emailed a feedback form. That is really important to us as the TIC coordinators. Uh, that's how we improve our tick sessions for future sessions. And this is our last session for the year. Again, if you want to connect with any of them, please do so. And thank you for coming.